Good morning and welcome to the Automation Morning Show for Thursday, December 21st, 2023. This is our last episode of 2023. This is episode 155. Would you believe we did 155 episodes this year? I am uh, want to thank you all for watching and, uh, you know, get in touch with me and for all your feedback this year. Really appreciate it. I really enjoy staying up to date and sharing what I learned with you. Uh, on the mornings, of course, we're in our winter hours, so we're only doing Tuesdays and Thursdays. But for 155 times this year, we've gotten together in the morning, and I know a lot of you watch it after the watch the show after the fact. But uh, it's just been a real pleasure to do this with you this year, and I look forward to doing more of these in 2024. And to that end, um, first let me go over to make sure the audio is working, the video is working. You see, I got a pile of stuff over there. It's so high I can't keep it out of the camera's area. But a bunch of new I.O. cards and like miscellaneous little things that I needed for my uh, for my upcoming uh, training courses that I'm filming. And, um, uh, yeah, I got this thing. This is for uh, a holder for my uh, my tablet when I'm uh, taking pictures. But in any case, uh, everything looks OK. And um, changing the lighting a little bit here because uh, that that fluorescent light is a little noisy. So I'm got it off today to see if it uh, actually reduces some of the background noise. But everything looks good. I do have the chat up if you want to say hi. And uh, if you're just tuning in, I want to wish you a very happy holiday. This is our last episode of the year. So happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and all that. And um, even though this is the last episode, um, I do have, and I'll be talking about this at the end of the show, we do have a lot of things going on. We have a podcast next week. We have uh, all these polls. We're going to be asking your opinions on who your favorite vendors are, suppliers are, products are, what's your favorite PLC, VFD, you know, HMI SCADA system. So we're going to be publishing that over the next several days at the automation blog. We'll talk about that more at the end of the show. We'll be doing it from Friday to Friday, except for, except for Christmas. So we definitely want to get you your input um, because that's going to really drive a lot of what we do in 2024 is, you know, what you're interested in, who are your favorite vendors, what products do you like? And um, so we're looking forward to getting that feedback from you. Now, with that said, because I won't be on, on my son's birthday, I want to wish him a very happy birthday. Well, let me say, first of all, if you have a birthday coming up in uh, this week or next, I want to wish you a very happy birthday. And I also want to wish my oldest son, John, a very happy birthday. We're so proud of him. He's a veteran. He served with honor. And uh, now he's um, going back to school and following his dreams. He's getting ready to get married. We can't wait to be down there for his uh, for his wedding. And uh, we're just so excited and happy to see him expanding his family and learning new things in college and, you know, getting a degree and just everything he's working on. Plus, he runs his own business on the side, too. So and plus, he's, you know, he's engaged in um, all that. So ha very happy birthday, John. We're very proud of you and um, can't wait to see you uh, next month. And with that, let's go ahead and get started with the show today. And um, it's kind of like I started a little early because I had I knew I had all those announcements to do at the beginning. We have more at the end. But in any case, let's go ahead and switch over to the uh, screen view here at 7.30 in the morning. And um, I just like to pull this up every now and again to remind new viewers that every single link we cover or that I tell you I'm going to post will be up at automate.news later today. And every single link from all 155 episodes will be up there at the end of today. We have 154 episodes up there now, but more episodes will be coming. And you know what I forgot to do? I forgot to pull... Um, I'm hearing some road noise out there, so I may have forgotten to, to do some things outside, but I'm not going to worry about it. We're just going to plow through it. Um, in any case, uh, that's automate.news, no www, no .com, just automate.news. And so with that, I do want to thank our sponsor today, uh, Siemens, for sponsoring this episode of the Automation Morning Show here. You can see we're looking at their SM1500 PLC. This thing is so cool. If you've never used one, this, especially the display on the front, I mean, I was excited back in the day, I don't know, 20 years ago, when uh, the Micrologics got little displays on them and we could actually see the IP address. This thing has blown that away. And it's just so very cool to have that display built in. It also has, uh, we've talked about view, view of things. Let me see if I can say that correctly. View of things in the past. So it um, allows it to serve up HMI-like screens and so on. So very cool product. And just want to shout out to Siemens for a sponsor in today's episode. Really appreciate that. Uh, from there, we go over to our first press release of today. I thought this was interesting. ABB and Volvo have uh, have uh, come up with an agreement. Volvo wants to use less energy to make their electric cars. 
and our electric vehicles. And so uh, they've worked with ABB to come up with a, I think they're gonna deploy, I think it's 1,300 robots in uh, next year to help make uh, manufacturing of their electric vehicles require less electricity. So of course, new generations of robots use electricity, but they're also more efficient in their moves and what they can do and the software's better. So congratulations to ABB on that. Uh, we also have a product uh, uh, or a press release from Global American, the IPC vendor. And uh, they're actually partnering with a crosser, a crosser to offer their computers to their customers. So they make a powerful uh, AI and edge computing uh, computers and uh, Global American has partnered with them to make those available here. Um, from there, we go over to a press release from Wago. Now, I won't be uh, linking to this, uh, to the press release because it's really just um, information, right? I'll link to the actual product page, but let's take a look at the press release. Uh, Wago is adding four to 20 milliamp analog input with digital displays to their line of IO-Link converters. Sounds very cool, right? So let's take a look over here. This is what they look like. So you bring your analog in, it converts this to IO-Link, but it also gives you a display on the actual little uh, uh, block here that shows you what the value is. And I believe you can actually do some scaling with their free software and you can actually change the color of the, the readout based on if it's an alarm or, or it's over, over uh, your alarm set point. So very interesting product from Wago. The other vendors have similar products, but this is the first time I've seen this product from Wago. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll actually link to the product page because the other two, you can get the pictures here and everything else here. Uh, from there, we go over to Pills and they just announced that they are up, they've updated their safety locking devices webpage. So I won't, I won't uh, link to this um, announcement because it's just an announcement. I'll actually link to the webpage that has all their safety interlocking devices on it. And from there we go to AS Rock Industrial. I think on Tuesday we talked about their Nuke Ultra 100. This is, uses the uh, Intel Ultra processors. Um, they also just released uh, the motherboard only, industrial motherboard only of the Nuke Ultra 100. So um, if you had a special case you had to use, um, you don't have to buy it already uh, in their case. Uh, you can just buy the motherboard and you can supply your own power supply and whatnot. So interesting uh, information there. And then from there, over at the ISA's website, automation.com, we have uh, some um, results of the latest EtherCAT uh, technical working group meeting. And uh, they just published uh, new profiles um, on liquid flow controllers, temperature sensors for wafer processing, uh, sensors for voltage and current frequency analysis, and special process control valves. So it's good to see the EtherCAT group continuing to expand their uh, specifications and allowing more and more products to connect to it. It is one of the, as we've seen, as we look at the top networks, you know, Profinet and Ethernet IP, they're at the top, but EtherCAT, I think, is a, a it comes in third place, if I remember correctly. Um, so good to see them uh, expanding as well. From there, we go to a featured product. And today, in honor of my sponsor, I'm featuring my S7 1500 and 1200 online course. You know, I was thinking this morning, this uh, course is level one. It's on 25% on sale. Um, a lot of people don't know when they're buying this course that this will turn into an ultimate course. So once I feel like we're starting to get into level two lessons, everybody who's in this course will see the name of the course they're already in change from S7 PLCs to like level one and two. Eventually it'll be the, an ultimate course. And uh, I will release the, uh, the level one only content as a separate course. So by investing in this course today, you're gonna grow and grow and get all the future content. And that's what I do. Currently all my courses that are either extended or level one and two, they, they are automatically enrolled for free in the 2024 ultimate courses. So, um, you know, that's something we, we want to support our students. We want to feel like if they've made an investment, even if it was nine years ago, if they've made an investment in our course, that they're going to keep getting what we do. I even go back to my original backers on Kickstarter for my first course. I offer them free upgrades all the time to thank them for backing me when I, when I uh, went to Kickstarter to actually launch my first course. So this is uh, S7 PLCs Level 1. There are new lessons coming in Level 1, and there will be new things coming in Level 2 and 3. So... Um, if you get in now, you'll get all that stuff. There'll be no additional charge. Uh, from there, we go over the banner. And banner 
has um, announcement on their R95C, eight-point analog input to Modbus Hub. These things are so cool. I think this picture just says it all. So this allows you to break eight different analog devices in and then connect it to Modbus, right? So we've seen this before for IO Link, but with IO Link, you gotta be pretty close, right? Here with Modbus, you can go, you know, it's if it's a 45, you can go like 4,000 feet, right? So very cool. And I think almost every major vendor supports Modbus natively, Modbus RTU natively. Um, so in any case, a very, very cool product. We do have several podcasts that we've filmed with, with uh, Banner already over the last uh, few years, and we have them coming on in early um, January. I don't know when that episode will actually publish um, because I don't remember when we actually record it. Typically, we need at least two weeks from the, at least a week from the day we record it to when we can release it. So I do know we have great episodes coming up with Schneider and Siemens, and now we have a great one that's going to be coming up with, with Banner. We also have Horner Automation coming on. We've already filmed it, but it's unsponsored, so it kind of falls after all the sponsored ones to kind of fill in the gaps between the sponsored releases. We, we give the sponsors the choice of the release week. I mean, it's the least we can do for them underwriting our costs. But in any case, very cool product. Uh, allows you to bring eight analog ins. You know, 4 to 20s and 0 to 10s, they don't go very far, right, compared to 4,000 feet with uh, 485. So very cool product there. And then we have a new product from Balif. We've had them on the podcast uh, last year. Um, look, I hope they get them back on the podcast this year, or I should say 2024, <laughs> next year. Um, in any case, uh, this is their new BMP Magnetic Field Position Measuring Systems, okay? And these systems are designed to, uh, let's see, where's the summary here? Usually I highlight it, but I was running a little late this morning. So much to cover today. But these are designed to um, monitor the position of piston, of pistons, piston position, on pneumatic cylinders and many other things. They have a lot of different case studies they can use for. Um, you know, they're used in predictive maintenance, they're used in condition monitoring, they used uh, in format changes and so on. So, and they support IO Link. So check that out if that's of interest to you. Excuse me for a second. <coughs> uh, excuse me. Um, all right, so from there we go over to PNF. They had an excellent article today on LF, HF, and UHF, when to select the ideal range for your RFID application and or how to select the ideal range for your RFID application. And this is a very good article. This is uh, very educational. I'll give it the EDU tag. Um, but it really goes through each range and what they're designed for and what they're perfect for and so on. And I thought it was very well done. But I think if you want to listen to this content, you can catch our podcast 112, okay, so P112, that we had RC back on the show, he's been on many times over the years, and he does a great job of going through um, RFID technology and the different ranges and what they're good for, and he has great pictures and charts, I try to put some of them in the thumbnail here, so um, if you're interested in RFID, uh, either read that article, which will be linked to from the autom automate.news website, or check out podcast 112. From there we go over the grace. I thought they had an excellent article here talking about what they think or, or how they think AI is going to revolutionize predictive maintenance. And we've talked about this many times. A lot of people are saying this, and it's true. I mean, if we think about AI in the realistic sense, not the Skynet sense, right? Not the futuristic, let's panic sense, right? And there's a lot of smoke and mirrors people are using to try to confuse people about AI. There's, there's no doubt about it, right? So, and a lot of hackers have revealed how they can compromise AI to make it say dumb things, right? So in any case, um, when we start talking about AI and industrial applications though, um, we're talking about better, better um, formulas, better algorithms, right? And uh, just better computing in general. And I like to tell people, it's like when you first got your uh, smart device, whether it was a Google or Amazon or, or Siri on iPhone or whoever, right? When you first got it, it maybe didn't do very much, right? And now today it does so much more, right? You can ask it, like we'll, we'll test ours at home. We'll ask it silly questions. We'll, we'll ask it to, do, to play different music. We'll, we don't even know that these songs exist, but we'll just try them. Like, who let the dogs in? I didn't even know there was a song named that. But, you know, you can get silly with them and they've really grown over time. Well, the same is happening in all industries, including predictive maintenance. These algorithms are just getting so much better that they're able to do, you know, what we couldn't do 20 years ago, we can do easily. I think one of the biggest places, besides predictive maintenance that we're seeing that, 
is in vision systems and cameras. And we've had uh, people on to talk about the cameras on the shows and talk about the machine learning. A lot of time in that instance, we're talking machine learning, but it's the same thing. It's the ability, you know, it's that old self-teach from the late 90s, early 2000s. That is now machine learning. So much smarter, so much better, and can do so much without the user's in, uh, intervention because it has, has a lot more, uh, you know, you know, if you talk to some AI experts, they'll say sometimes they can take these AI models and turn them into really precise algorithms. And those algorithms end up in our products because while you can't fit, you know, $10 million worth of uh, large language model training into a small little, you know, $100 device, if you, can, if you can turn it into an algorithm, you can. So this is an article in that whole area. Of course, I'll tag this with artificial intelligence over at automate.news and predictive maintenance. So I've been tagging everything since July, and uh, so you'll be able to search on that. From there, we go over the Copia, and they're talking, you know, Copia has their uh, asset management software. It's Git-based. It's, um, it um, uh, lets you uh, work, do collaborative engineering, but it all, they also have the device link, which automatically uploads and stores and pre produces reports on what is in your devices. And uh, they bring up a good point. Um, and, and I hearken back to, so let me give you the title of the article. It's, are you missing the layer, this layer in your cybersecurity stack? So when we talk about cybersecurity, a lot of it we talk about zero trust, don't let the bad guys in, right? But what happens if they get in, maybe on a, on a cell phone that was hacked at a coffee shop, right? And the guy brings his cell phone into the plant and they use that as a vector to get into your uh, cybersecurity, into your uh, industrial control system, right? So what do you do then? Well, you know, uh, identifying that that's happened is extremely important, but you have to have a backup plan, right? I remember when I was taking Windows Server classes to get certified for Windows Server, at the time it was NT, that's how old it was. And I, I did eventually get the, the, the certification both for uh, workstation and server, but um, one of the things we learned in that class is most customers who do not back up their data, and this is going back in the 90s, go out of business. If you have a devastating uh, fire or crash or something and you lose all your data most companies go out of business they just can't survive without that data and that's why it's important to have a backup plan and it's not enough just to back it up in your in your office which is right next to the process you need to back it up somewhere off-site right and so um that's just common it 101 type something you have to do and so um that's what they're talking about in this article it's like look you may be stopping people with you know firewalls and gateways and all these things and you know, doing the zones and conduits like we talked about with Red Lion, but if you don't, um, if you don't have backups of all your current programs, you know, even though you may have a great mitigation program to 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 get the hacker out of your network, you know, you don't have the programs. You may not be able to get that machine running again. I know I've over the years, the last thirty three years, I've had so many people call and say the program's gone. It's a very complicated machine. How do we do it? And it's like you just sit there as a programmer, like. Re-engineering this from scratch is going to be a nightmare because the guarantee nobody there knows everything about the machine. So um, in any case, I thought they did a good job explaining that in this article. And uh, staying on the same topic, we go to ISA's website, automation.com, and they have an article about the five advanced cyber descent defense strategies for automated operations. And I'll just give you the bullets here for the sake of time. So uh, first they talk about uh, changing cyber threats, which is very true. Uh, you know, more complex malware, increase in ransomware attacks. We've seen that in so many articles documented. Of course, with IoT and IoT, more connected devices are coming in. So there's more vectors they can attack you through. And then of course, phishing, which is a huge problem. I'm, I get phishing, uh, I, I'm, and uh, unfortunately, the FTC does not allow us to report them directly anymore. They say, oh, no, we got it under control. Well, if you had it under control, I wouldn't keep getting these emails. So to the FTC, you have to allow us to uh, use that spam at UCE email again so we can report them because you're not catching them all. Um, I'll get off my soapbox. And um, uh, so from there, they go to their five things to consider, right? And, and here's the things they have on the list. They have de deception technology, uh, micro segmentation, I think that really goes into zones and conduits, um, AI and ML, machine learning defense solutions. So again, mo more advanced algorithms, zero trust model, which I'm a big fan of and we talked about a lot this year, and endpoint detection and response, which we were just talking about with uh, Copia. 
um, in that Copia article. So uh, excellent article there if you want to read more. This will get tagged with the cybersecurity tag up at automate.news. Now, if you're interested in cybersecurity, just yesterday, we released our ISA Secure uh, podcast where I sit down and I talk to Andre Restino from the ISA. He's kind of heading up the whole ISA Secure uh, Automation and Control System Security Assurance Certification Program up at the ISA. They're currently looking for some big vendors to join in and become foundational members of this. And um, they actually get the, 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 the specification for free if they, if they um, and it's pretty reasonable for companies, not for individuals, but for companies, it's very reasonable to join. And, uh, oh, I just noted that, noticed that uh, SNG is in the chat. Hey, good morning, SNG. Good to see you. Um, so if you're interested in ISA Secure, this is right from the, the guy running it over at the uh, ISA, it, again, Andre Restino. And he comes in and, uh, um, you know, brings us up to speed on it. So you, it's available on all the locations that you find the Automation Morning Show. And uh, you can see them all up here in the thumbnail if you're watching. Everything from iTunes to uh, Alexa to uh, Podchaser and so on. Spotify and so on. So um, from there, I also wanted to throw out a reminder that we also had the ISA on to talk about 62443. So ISA, IEC 62443. So that was Eric Cosman. I think he did a great job of covering that. And uh, if you want to learn more about that, that was podcast 110. Yesterday's podcast was podcast 184. Okay. And from there, I thought this was an excellent article from A3. This is the Association for Advancing Automation, I believe, if I get that right. And uh, this is smart manufacturing, 10 foundational elements you need to know. And uh, I thought it was good. I'll cover some of the bullets. I, I, but uh, if, you wanna, if you're looking for something to read this holiday week, check this out. Uh, number one, digital twins and simulation. Number two, AI and machine learning. Number three, robotics and automation. Number four, IoT or IoT. Number five, uh, data and analytics. Data analytics and big data. Number six, cloud computing. Seven, predictive and prescriptive maintenance. Eight, flexibility and adaptability. Nine, integration of advanced technologies. I would say new technologies. Um, and 10, sustainability and environmental consideration. I would also add in there energy savings, right? Because, you know, one of the reasons a lot of things are purchased are, are made in countries that use very dirty power, unlike the U.S. and most developed nations, undeveloped nations that make things inexpensively, have extremely dirty power. They have the dirtiest coal plants in the world are in these, um, what I would call, you know, uh, developing nations. Some don't see it that way, but here's the, here's the word on the street, right? These places, just like the top 1% produce most of the CO2, over 50% of the CO2 from, you know, flying around in jets and driving big cars and all the, their big houses. Um, you know, we want inexpensive products, but we're buying them from places that make it with the dirtiest power on the planet. I mean, dozens of times dirtier than what we have in our country. So in any case, so in addition to sustainability and environmental consideration, I would also say energy efficiency because that hits the bottom line, right? You know, you can feel good because you're, you have a sustainable process, but did it hit the bottom line, right? Or what you, is what you're doing uh, providing value to your employees, your community, and, and your stakeholders, right? The three-legged stool of business. So I think that's very important to consider is, um, is, is that, because you know what, if, I don't know how, we've talked about this on the show, people buy a product that's supposed to be green, but that product produces more CO2 in its creation than 20 years use of the product they're replacing. And so it's like, it's not really green, it's a, it's a scam. So I'll, again, man, last show of the year, I'm really on my soapbox. So that's why we have the talk back link so you can send in your feedback and tell me where you think I'm wrong. And uh, I say good morning to Henry. He says, good vibes, good vibes. We get great vibes. So, um, and what I, why I brought up this slide here is because even though I'm on vacation next week, this is, I think, the first vacation, the first time I've taken, um, taken uh, this week off, the week after Christmas in several years. I can't remember the last time I did. But it was just the right time for my wife and I to go on a little getaway. But just because I'm uh, on vacation next week doesn't mean we won't have any content. And I'll talk more about this at the end of the show, but I did want to point out here, as we're talking about trends in industrial automation, that I've edited my, uh, my uh, 
it was the Siemens uh, Control Panel Symposium. I think it was in October, actually. I said it was last month, but I think it was actually in October. So I've edited that. I've kind of chopped it down, made it a little bit more efficient and easier to listen to. And um, I'm republishing it next week, even though I'm not around, as episode 185 of Automation Podcast. I think you guys will really enjoy it. We cover a lot of new topics. Because it was a Siemens event, there were certain topics I couldn't cover, but we still cover a wide broth of topics from a number of different vendors. And uh, I think you guys will enjoy it. So you'll see that next week. Trends in Industrial Automation, that is Podcast 185. Um, from there, I want a featured uh, guide of the day is our S7-1200 guide. So we talked about our S7-1500 guide recently. I wanted to talk about our S7-1200 guide. As we finish our 10-year anniversary at the Automation blog this year, um, we have uh, this year, one of the things we did is we took all the content we did on our top 16 products that we've covered over the years, and we've, um, we've put it uh, into guides, right? So now you can see there's over 40 articles and videos on how to get started with the SM1500 completely free, just like all 1,700 plus articles and videos at the automation blog are completely free. So check that out. Um, I did not write all of these. We had Brandon write some. We had some third, uh, some uh, freelancers write things, things like on PLC Sim Advanced, on using, um, you know, we have interviews with people from uh, Pro on Profinet and like a deep, this is detailed technical uh, presentation. This is not the glossy type of thing. This is really gets into the weeds, which I love. I love the technical stuff. So um, in any case, we have my video where I, I read in tags from a Control Logics uh, in an S7-1500 with no no expensive gateway needed. Um, we also have, uh, you know, articles on using SCL language for the first time, writing function blocks, and just all kinds of good stuff. So check that out completely free over at theautomationblog.com. How do you get to the guides there? Just go to the guides in the menu. You'll see all 16 of them. We hope to add more in the future, but these are the products we've written the most about. We do have some really popular products in Mitsubishi, but just I think we only have maybe seven or eight articles total on them. So we didn't make a god out of it. It, did, it didn't seem like it. You know, we tried to get at least 20, 20 videos and articles to, to do a guide. Um, from there, we go over to automation.com, the ISA's website, and we have four predictions for 2024. And uh, number one, I'm not going to read the whole article, but we'll uh, talk about the bullets. AI will set a new pace of development in robotics and automation. We've talked about that a lot, a lot this year. Uh, number two, developments in robotic software will enable more sharing and reuse. And I, I think up here, I forgot in the title, it says, uh, the, the subtitle of the article is AI set to supercharge robotic automation. That's why everything's robotic related. So we will start over. AI will set a new pace. Development and robotic software will enable more sharing and reuse. Uh, number three, companies will fuse IT and OT data to improve operations. That kind of that's like for everything, not just robotics. Logistics will be a focus area for robotics. That makes a lot of sense to me. So those are the uh, their four bullets. If you want to learn more, we'll link to this article from Automate.News. All right, with that we have a new. And I'm just looking at the time, so I'm not going to go into these in detail, but we have a couple of new uh, application stories. This one is from Pills and how they helped retrofit a dairy palletizing system when the current system, safety system they were using, was uh, obsoleted. And so Pills was able to bring their system in, their light curtains and other things, and uh, muting was very important in these applications. And uh, so they detail that in this application story. Um, there was also a good one from Red Lion, but as I've run into many times this year, they between last night and this morning, they've changed the URL or the file name. And so um, we're not going to be able to cover it today because I didn't have time to go back and find out what they renamed it. Um, as far as events, I know I've already talked about this one, but it's next week on the 26th, right? So this is how does IOLink work from Horner Automation. Um, got to meet those guys recently and record an episode with them. Great guys. Um, they, they've they're one of the best companies for doing a weekly uh, uh, live stream. And um, next week, even though it's December 26th, they're going to be having at uh, 2 p.m. on Tuesday uh, uh, a live webinar about how does IOLink work. So uh, there's one other one I want to tell you about here. This is from the folks over at HBK or HBM, you may know them as. Um, and this is Get Smart in Your Weighing Technology and Save Time and Money. This is on January 5th, 3 p.m. IST uh, this may be too early for us. So I didn't realize it said IST. 
It's 10.30 a.m. CET. If that's Central European time, then it's super early in the morning here. So I wouldn't have shared this if I would have looked at that. Sorry, guys. But they, we've done some great shows with them. They've had some great uh, topics. Uh, one on the same vein is strain gauge force sensor technology. This is one of the, a very technical show. We do talk about their products at the end, but they really go into, you know, tef definitely educational. If you haven't uh, used strain gauge force sensors or you don't understand how they work, or maybe you learned about it years ago, but you've forgotten a lot about it, like I know I have, um, this is a great episode. It's very technical, and uh, I think Chris Novak does a great job going through that technology. Then we had him on, so let me go back here. I didn't say the podcast number for the uh, audio audience. That is podcast 127. So great episode there. Now, if we go over to the, another episode we did with them, this is uh, on their smart signal conditioners. This is podcast 105. And this is their ClipX line of smart signal conditioners. The Clip and the ClipX are kind of like they're all over the industry, right? But these do some really cool things that I didn't, even I didn't know they did. And so um, if you need a signal conditioner, I definitely recommend checking out this episode. Uh, uh, Nehemiah did a great job on that one. Uh, from there, we go to firmware updates. What's new with firmware? Well, we talked about on Tuesday there was some ET200SP uh, updates. Um, I think they were GSD files. And so today we have new firmware for the TM Pulse uh, 2 by 24 volt, as well as the AQ2XUST module. So if you have those modules, you definitely want to check out these firmwares to see if you need them. There's also an update for WinCC 8.0 and uh, WinCC 8.0 Asia. From there, we go to new literature. We got quite a bit of new literature from Rockwell today. The first one for you control logics and compact logics users out there. This is an updated manual, version 10 of the Logix Designer Compare Tool. So new user's manual on that. And um, they also had several new installation instructions for the 1762 modules, which are the I.O. that we use on the 1200 and 1200 and 1100. And um, it's kind of strange because they're, they're, the products aren't new by any state, uh, any uh, um measure, but uh, in any case, they have new installation instructions on the OB16, the OB8, the OW8, the IQ8, the OA8, and the IT4 and IR4. So if you're using 1762 IO, I don't even know if they're still selling it, but if you're using it, all the install instructions are, have been updated. Uh, with that, over on Emerson's site, we had a new LS200 direct, operated, uh, direct <laughs> operated regulator um, instruction manual come out. We had this new uh, compilation uh, document that has all their field support documentation. So you can hear, see um, links to the flow computers, links to control wave, links to uh, their flow boss, and so on. So in any case, uh, there's that. And then we had a new uh, data sheet on AMS optics. So if you're using the AMS system, you may want to check that out. From there, over on Siemens site, we found some new manuals. This one's on the Sim, uh Synamics S200 Profinet Servo Drive System. Um, I'm really excited. We do have that show. I think it's scheduled for mid to late January where I sit down with Siemens and learn all about the S200 and I think the S210, if I remember correctly, or S220. Let's see, I already forgot. But uh, it was a great podcast. I learned a lot about these servo drives in that podcast. So that's coming early next year. And then, of course, we had, um, and I, I've heard of this before, and I believe... I believe this Connect Gateway is also being used with their uh, virtual PLC, but I haven't sat down and talked to the folks on that P on that product yet. I'm looking forward to it. So, um, but there is a new manual on the Connect Gateway from Siemens, and a new manual on the PCS7 um, Condition Monitoring Library. This is a README, and it's um, so if you're using PCS7, check that out. Now, from there, this is our science and technology article of the day. This is not the end of the show. Usually, this is the last thing I cover. But I do have some things to talk about what's coming. But uh, in any case, I thought this was very interesting. This is from IEEE Spectrum. And it says, meet the full LED that is transforming the sp display. So going back decades, we were hearing about OLED, OLED, OLED. And everybody agrees, OLED displays have the richest stocks, right? They're, LCDs don't have really rich black blacks, right? But OLEDs do have a very dark black color. So whether it's a VR headset or just a regular display, they have the best uh, color range, right? But there's a problem. They're not very energy efficient with some of the colors they use. And so there's been a challenge on 
to develop a new blue photophorescent material to uh, fix that, right? To make them more energy efficient. And so um, this article goes through it and it goes through it in quite uh, good detail. I really enjoyed it. They start talking about, you know, electron spins and how sometimes you get, you get, uh, you know, maybe three electrons instead of one photon and they really go through it in great detail. And I think the FOLED, instead of OLED, I think we're going to hear that a lot in 2024 as this is getting ready to be commercialized and it should really make our, like our, our mobile devices, their batteries last a lot longer because it's much more energy efficient, this new combination of materials. Um, so in any case, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, check that article out at IEEE Spectrum. Now from there, uh, just a couple of things. I do want to thank Siemens for sponsoring the show. You can see this is the page for the S7-1200. The starter pack for this guy, now I don't know if they're still in stock or not, but the starter pack for this guy is the best deal on the market, I think. I mean, it programs just like the S7-1500. Um, only three languages though, but uh, you get a lifetime copy of the software and the PLC for less than the price of a PLC. So very cool. I've done unboxings on that before and stuff if you want to know more. Um, and, and now we get into every sign the wish holiday wishes out there. So this is our last episode of the year. So I thought I'd just pull up a few of these. We have Automation ML, wishing everybody a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year and a Happy Holiday. We have the people over at Pills. Uh, they had, um, this is a nice... Uh, um, look back on their year. I really enjoyed this article. And uh, so I definitely will link to it, but it talks about all the big events they had. They had a big celebration where they invited all the families of all their employees and all their former employees to come. They had a big, uh, big celebration at their plant. It was just really hot warming. So uh, they're wishing us, uh, uh, you know, a happy Christmas, which is what they say in uh, Europe. We say Merry Christmas. They say Happy Christmas. And uh, then we also have a Merry Christmas from Maple Systems. This is supposed, this is an email template. That's why you see first name. Um, so um, if you are on their mailing list, you'll get this in your email box, but it was great to see that. And uh, I thought it'd be fun. Like, so on Christmas day, I usually will have the blog release a, a, a post that says, you know, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And I thought it would be fun to take a look at some of those pictures from over the years. So this is, I think the first one we did back 10 years ago, 2013. Uh, Merry Christmas from the automation blog. It's low res. Back at that time, the, they, the, the blogs were really trying to shrink down your pictures to save on bandwidth. And, you know, I guess they were assuming people are still on dial up. I don't know. But in any case, so this is uh, the one. I didn't have time to go look for the high res version of this. But so each year I've taken a picture of what my wife's done for the Christmas tree. This looks like we had, this one looks like it's a real tree. So we had, uh, 10 years ago, we had a real tree. Uh, some of the kids were still at home, you know, so... In any case, uh, we go from there. So this is, um, you know, let me let me bop out of uh, full screen mode so I can see what year this was. This was, yeah, I can't. Not, not even a chance without my glasses. Um, this one was uh, 2014. So you can see the uh, tree there. This looks like a fake tree. Look at how thin those needles are. But in any case, uh, let's go to the next one. This was uh, 2015. So you can see that there. And then this is 2019. So again, my wife does a great job with the decorations and, um, you know, in our house every year. Here we have uh, 2020. And I just, I, I'm just amazed at how, like, all the decorations changes and she changes the bulbs and, the, and all that stuff. And here is 2021. And uh, I think that's it. So I'll have a new picture of the tree uh, for uh, 2023 up. And I just wanted to share those with you. I thought it was fun looking back. You can actually see me taking the picture right here in the bulb, but uh, in this one too. But in any case, um, with that said, uh, before we get to the final notes for today and for our last show, I do want to thank everybody who signed up uh, at automation.locals.com this year. There's over 1,300, I think it was 1,365 of you who've joined our community. This is in lieu of us having our own forum. The uh, barrier entry is two bucks. It's a cup of coffee. So if you want to come and ask me questions or you just want to chat about stuff, I check this every workday and uh, I do my best to answer questions as much as I can. If I don't know anything about it, I'll just tell you, hey, I've never used a CNC machine, so I can't tell you how to work it. Right? Or maybe it's like a PLC brand I've never used, like a BNR PLC. You've never used it? Can't give you any advice. But if it's Alan Bradley or Siemens or something else we've covered at the blog, I'll definitely try my best to help you with it. And we, you can see all that back and forth when you become a, uh, a member for one cup of coffee a month. So that's automation.locals.com. And then I do want to thank everybody who this year who bought my eBooks, my video collections, our coffee cups, our T-shirts. 
You guys are the best. Every penny of profit goes right back into the show and site. Uh, with that, um, just a final reminder before we get to the end of the year stuff, all the links that I talked about that I said I would publish will be published up at automate.news later today. I know some days it goes late into the night until I get them up there because you just get so busy, but um, we will have all 155 shows for the year of 2023, all the links published up there. I'm working on some other things too, can't announce yet, but uh, I hope uh, hope to uh, have even more links up here uh, by the first of the year. So with that, I got to get to my end of year notes here and let me just go full screen and uh, take off my glasses. I don't, I just don't like wearing glasses. But in any case, um, so some of the uh, end of year notes that I wanted to cover here with you. All right. So first of all, this is the last episode, uh, 155 of the live show. Uh, we will be back the first week of January. I have some really cool things I want to do for that week, um, but I don't know uh, if they're going to come out or not. So we'll, we'll definitely be back here the first week of January. Um, and on that note, we will also have a special edition of the Automation Podcast. So there is a recorded uh, episode coming out next week of the Automation Podcast. We talked about trends in industrial automation. And then the, five, the, the week I come back, we'll do our year-end wrap-up, which I usually do the week before, you know, between Christmas and, uh, Christmas and New Year's. So we'll do that the first week of um, January. And then we have a bunch of already recorded shows uh, that, we'll re -listen, re bleh, that we will be releasing in the first week of January. Now, um, that said, even though I'm on uh, vacation next week, besides the podcast, we're also going to be publishing um, our first ever Audience Choice Award surveys or polls. So starting this Friday and going through next Friday, right, except for Christmas Day, every day there will be a new poll. And I want to really encourage you guys to come to the automationblog.com and vote in these polls. Polling will close on midnight um, on December 31st, right? So uh, January 1st, they'll be closed. And so what we're trying to do is find out what your favorite vendors are, what your favorite distributors are, what your favorite um, products are, what's your favorite PLC, what's your favorite HMI, what's your favorite SCADA, what's your favorite VFD, whose sensors do you prefer? We're trying to get all that information to give me guidance going into 2024. So I really, really want, just want to ask you if you have any time in the net from Friday to Friday, please go up to the automationblock.com and vote in some or all of the polls um, so we know, um, you know what your interests are. And that's going to be a big help to us going forward. And then you can see the results. You can see what your colleagues are voting on. So uh, in any case, uh, please get up there before January 1st. Uh, again, the first poll will release on Friday of this week. So with that said, um, as far as I already talked about the special plans for the morning show and the podcast the first week of January, and then I finally uh, kind of close out the show here. I want to thank you all for tuning in. Whether this is the first episode you watch, it's kind of a longer episode because it's the end of the year episode. But in any case, whether this is the first time you watch or if you've been with me since the beginning, 10 years ago, you know, this year we celebrated 10 years of the automation blog. Uh, I just want to thank you because it's with, without, you know, if nobody was watching the shows, I wouldn't just want to do them, right? So why would I just do something if nobody's watching them? So the fact that you guys are watching them and that a lot of you, you know, maybe even 10% of you are going in there, mashing that like button, mashing that subscribe button. It just means the world to me. It's, it's When I say it's the fuel that keeps the show on the air, it truly is. Because the day I see people stop watching them is the day I stop doing them. So as long as they're valuable to you, I'm going to keep at it. And uh, I just want to thank you. Thank you for reading our articles and watching our videos at the Automation Blog, watching our live streams. I got some exciting stuff I'm trying to pull off for 2024, you know, in uh, 2022, my goal was, my stretch goal was to do a podcast every week. And that was that was very hard to pull off, but I did it. And uh, we did it again this year. And this year, my goal was to do a morning show at least a couple of times a week. And while we didn't do, how many work days are there in a year? 200 and something. Uh, we didn't do 200 and something days, but we did 155. And most podcasts don't make the 100th show, right? Most video series and podcasts don't make it to 100. We did 155 in one year, so I'm very proud of you for tuning in and giving me the the uh, the um, being the fuel that keeps me going because you guys are you got if you if nobody's like I said if nobody was watching I wouldn't be doing these things so I love hearing from you guys you get the feedback link you get the talk back link you get the news tip link um, you get the ability to tip me uh, buy me a cup of coffee just a one time deal or you can join automation.locals.com. And for one cup of coffee a month, you can join in the conversation, answer questions, ask questions, and do all that. 
But uh, it was a it was a very busy year, a crazy year. But I'm really looking forward to the next year. I got to reach out to the vendors and find out about their trade shows for next year because I'm excited. I definitely want to do manufacturing in America again if they hold it. Definitely want to do automate this year and uh, automation fair. Maybe it's way. I think it's going to be on the west coast, so I don't know about that. But um, I'm excited, and if there's any trade shows you think I should go to, let me know as well. And with that, I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas, or if you don't celebrate Christmas, a very happy holiday, whatever you're celebrating. Um, and I want to wish you a very happy and safe New Year's Day and New Year's Eve. And I'm just going to look over, and Larry, thank you, Larry. I love seeing your comments and everything you're posting over on LinkedIn, and uh Thank you for the holiday wishes. I really appreciate it, man. You're the best. Um, and with that, I want to wish you all, again, an awesome holiday, an awesome new year. And uh, I just want to encourage you, no matter what happens, stay courageous, right? Stay fearless. And until next time, my friends, until next year, my friends, peace.